Hi, and welcome to the CISS Aero Academy. I'm Cyrus Hung, and today, for our first lesson, we will be looking at the four forces of flight. We will be talking about what the forces of flight are and what is their role in flight. Then, we will go in-depth into each of these forces, as well as explaining how they are generated. First of all, there are primarily four forces of aerodynamics that act upon any aircraft. They are, as shown on the screen, lift, drag, thrust, and weight. Some may think that these forces only apply to planes, but that is not the case. Just about any airborne vehicle utilizes these four forces to achieve flight, just in different ways. No matter if it's a normal commercial airplane, uh, a helicopter, a frisbee, or even a simple paper airplane, the four forces of flight are utilized to their advantage. When all four forces are in balance, straight and level flight is sustained, thus allowing us to fly. We will begin by examining the most straightforward of the four forces, weight. Weight is simply the force generated by the gravitational pull of the Earth that applies to all things. However, unlike the other forces of flight, which are mechanical forces, weight is special because it is a field force. This means that a plane does not need to be in physical contact with another object to experience weight. Weight, as with other forces, is a vector quantity, and thus has a direction and a magnitude associated with it. This is a simplified version of the gravity formula, which many are familiar with. It disregards the altitude at which the aircraft flies. However, it will suffice for this lesson. The most important takeaway from this simplified formula is that the magnitude of the weight vector is proportional to the mass of the aircraft. This is important because as the aircraft flies, the mass changes as fuel is burned. As a result, the airplane must continuously work to adjust other vectors to ensure that equilibrium is continuously sustained. Here lies one of the two biggest challenges of flight, to overcome the weight of the aircraft in some way to achieve sustained flight. In addition, the weight vector always originates from the center of mass of the aircraft. This is the point at which the weighted relative position of the aircraft equals zero. The center of mass also changes slightly during the course of the flight as weight at different points are moved, increased, or decreased. Thus, it is important to, that adjustments are made during a flight to keep the plane constantly balanced. The direction of the weight vector is always pointing towards the center of the Earth. During the flight, the airplane always rotates about this point. Here lies the second challenge of aviation. How do we control the aircraft during flight to make these adjustments to control for changes in the airplane's weight and center of mass? To discuss the solutions to these two challenges, we must first introduce the other forces of flight. Next, we will begin to examine the force of thrust. To begin that, we must first turn to high school physics and look at Newton's three laws, specifically his third. It simply states that every action must have an equal and opposite reaction. When you push against the wall and apply a force, the wall pushes back with equal force, which is why the wall stops your finger. In a similar sense, a rocket uses a jet engine to propel itself forward. It does this by burning a propellant and shooting it backwards with extreme speed, similar to filling up a balloon and letting go of its neck. The propellant shoots backwards, thus creating a reactionary force forwards relative to the rocket, producing thrust, a force in the direction that the rocket is traveling. This analogy can be extended to airplanes, whose turbines push air backwards, accelerating it in the opposite direction of where the airplane is headed towards. This creates a reactionary force forwards, generating thrust. This is the mechanism by which airplanes can accelerate forwards through the air. So, to recap, we have talked about two of the four forces of flight, weight and thrust. Weight is simply generated because of the gravitational pull of the Earth while thrust is produced by the engines of the aircraft, which accelerates a mass backwards, namely air, thus producing a reactionary force forward towards the flight path. It's also important to note here that the forces oppose each other. Thrust, whose direction is towards the flight path, opposes drag, which acts backwards, while the upwards force of lift opposes the downwards force of weight. In our next section, we will be discussing lift and how it is generated by the wings. To explain how an airplane actually generates lift, we must once again turn towards high school physics and look at Newton's laws of motion. In conjunction with the third law, we must examine the first law, which states that a body at rest will remain at rest, and a body in motion will continue in straight line motion, unless subjected to an external applied force. This is important because it shows how wind in the sky, without any force acting on it, will always flow in one direction. Now, 
Say the wind was somehow deflected downwards. That would mean, as Newton's first law suggests, that an external force has been applied to the wind that caused it to change direction. We now bring in our old friend Newton's third law. By principle, the fact that the wind was deflected downwards must mean a reactionary force upwards must have been generated at the same time. Thus, this would indicate that by somehow deflecting or directing the wind downwards, we can create a reactionary force that produces lift. This is what a wing actually does to create lift. But how does it do this? Before we actually begin talking about how airplanes generate lift, it is also important to see an incorrect model of lift. This is the popularized yet incorrect model of how wings on an airplane generate lift. This explanation relies on the idea that the unique shape of an airplane wing causes the pressure below the wing to exceed that of the pressure above the wing. Because of the equal transit time idea, because the air has to travel a longer distance above the wing, the speed must be faster than that of the air below the wing, as they must have equal transit times by the end of the wing. According to the Bernoulli principle, faster fluids, which refer to both gases and liquids, cause lower pressures. The higher pressure pushes the wing upwards, while the lower pressure above the wing pulls the wing upwards as well. The theory isn't completely incorrect, as differing air pressures are indeed involved with lift, but it doesn't tell the full story. This theory also comes with several flaws that prevent it from fully working, one of which is how the air is shown to leave the wing without any changes. That would mean that no force was acted upon the air, and thus no reaction was generated. One other obvious flaw is that if this idea of deferring pressures is the only reason how airplanes fly, it doesn't explain how an airplane is able to fly upside down. If the wings generate lift only by using higher and lower pressures in accordance with the Bernoulli principle, flying upside down would result in a higher pressure above the wing and lower pressure below the wing, causing the airplane to crash. So here is how an airplane actually generates lift. The air around the wing tends to stick to the wing. This is known as the Kowanda effect and results in the air leaving the wing to be directed downwards. The air underneath the wing is also directed downwards. As the air leaves the end of the wing turned down, it must follow that a downward momentum was gained. Thus, according to the law of conservation of momentum, an equal and opposite change in momentum must be felt by the wing. This upwards reactionary momentum is lift. The turning of air works in conjunction with the idea of deferring pressures and the Bernoulli effect we examined before, save for one big difference. First, air is compressed at the tip of the wing, and this causes the wind above the wing to experience far higher speeds relative to the air below the wing. However, this is where the equal transit time theory is incorrect. The air moving above the wing does not need to reach the end of the wing at the same time with the air below the wing. Air travels much faster and reaches the end quicker above the wing. And according to the Bernoulli principle, this would create a zone of lower pressure above the wing, which pulls the aircraft upwards. So, how can we increase lift? There are primarily two ways to generate more lift. One is to simply increase the difference in velocity between the air and the wing, namely by increasing the speed of the airplane. This would result in the magnitude of the air deflected to increase, thus increasing the magnitude of the lift vector, in turn generating more lift. The second method involves increasing the angle of attack, which essentially means to tilt the wing upwards relative to the direction of airflow. This would cause the air directed downwards to have a more vertical direction plus producing more reactionary force upwards. However, tilting the angle of attack too high would cause the Kawanda effect to stop working, thus causing stalling, where the air no longer sticks to the upper surface of the wing. This would prevent lift from being generated, thus causing the plane to crash. To supplement the ideas above, here is the lift formula, which calculates the magnitude of the lift vector. The direction of the lift is always perpendicular to the flight path through the wing's center of lift, which is similar to how the weight vector goes through the plane's center of mass. The formula shows the relationship between lift and four variables. The coefficient of lift, which accounts for several things such as the angle of attack, the surface area of the wing, the air pressure, and the velocity of the air. As you can see here, the coefficient of lift and the velocity is directly proportional to lift generated. Thus, this is how an airplane imposes weight, 
by generating lift through the downwards turning of air by its wings. Lastly, we will be briefly examining drag, the force that opposes thrust. As we will be going in depth on the different types of drag in another video, we won't stay too long on this subject. Drag is a mechanical force that is generated by every part of the plane. Specifically, it is generated by the interaction between a solid body, which is the plane in this case, and the fluid around it, which is the air. The difference in velocities between the plane and the air is what produces drag. If there is no motion or fluid, there is no drag. Drag acts in the opposite direction to the aircraft's motion. In that sense, we could think of drag as aerodynamic friction. In addition, drag is split into several different types. One type includes induced drag, which is generated by the turning of air by the wings. There is also parasitic drag, which consists of skin friction drag, interference drag, and form drag. We will be going far more in-depth on these types of drag in our next video. So, to recap all that we have learned today, here is a brief conclusion page. The four forces of flight are lift, thrust, and drag. In order to have sustained flight, each of these must be balanced. Weight is the gravitational pull of the aircraft towards the Earth. Thrust is produced by propellers that accelerate a mass backwards. Lift is produced by the downward turning of air, thus producing a reaction force upwards. Drag is produced by every part of the aircraft and must be counteracted by thrust in order for the flight to move forwards. And here are the works cited. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.